Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Glad that you are here today. Hope that you um, got enough to eat this week, got enough football to uh, satisfy you for at least a week, right, until we try again next weekend. And I uh, hope that uh, you come today with that posture of recognizing that really every day we have an opportunity to bring our thanks to God for who He is and what He's done for us. And I hope that in worship we recognize, you know, we tend to think like the people up front are the actors and you're the audience and you walk away and say, well, that was pretty good this week or that was, you know, not so great or whatever. But the reality, as a philosopher pointed out back in the 1700s, that uh, we are all the actors and God is the audience and God is the only one who can walk away and go, well, I didn't get much out of that. And that hope we bring that posture to worship is that bring our thoughts, our prayers, our songs are all sung to God as the audience as a way of saying thank you to him. We are, we are, we are wrapping up our sermon series uh, today on 2 Timothy. If you've been with us through this, you can say confidently, hey, I've studied the book of 2 Timothy. And if you're here with us before that, we did Ruth. And so you got two books down. And so that's bragging rights when you go to cocktail parties with other Christians. Be like, well, how many books have you studied this fall? You go like, I did two, Ruth and 2 Timothy. And, you know, not a lot of competition for people studying 2 Timothy. So you got, you got a reason to stand out. But it's, uh, it's a great letter, and it's a letter that we've been focused on now with this emphasis of what Paul says at the very beginning. Rekindle the gift that's been given to you. Flat, uh, fan it into a flame and pursue it. Seek, seek it with great passion because it's the reason you've been created. Every one of us has on, uh, at this time in this place, has a purpose for existence that God has given to you. And we want you to recognize that. And whatever it is, pursue it. Fan, pursue it with such energy and devotion that it's like a fire being fanned into flame, fire being rekindled, because that's the reason God created you to live. In fact, it shouldn't surprise us that that's a created purpose for us, because research has shown is that one of the ways that we are happy, one of the key things of happy people is that they recognize that they live for something bigger than themselves. And so it shouldn't surprise us, because it's counterintuitive, Right? It's counterintuitive in that most of us might think, well, you know, the way to be happy is just do more stuff you like. Like, I like to shoot clays. I like to work out. I like to eat. Man, I could have Thanksgiving every day, except I couldn't get out of the house weighing 500 pounds, right? I love that. And there's all kinds of opportunities we have. And in this culture, we are mass consumers. It's real easy to just consume more of the things that you think are your heart's desires, and surely that's going to make you happy. And what it's shown is it doesn't. Because in our culture, we have so many ideas, so many ways to consume, but we also have so many unhappy people. So what I hope is that as we wrap this up, whether God's got a hold of you yet or not, is that you just hang on to that idea. What's the purpose and the reason right now? doesn't matter how old you are. You can be in... Elementary school, you could be going from here over to, uh, you know, a skilled care facility. Whatever. It doesn't matter. What's your purpose? What's God called you to do? Now, next week, we're starting a new series. I'm kind of excited about it because I love C.S. Lewis. And we're going to be, the inspiration for our Christmas series, season is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's Narnia and Christmas. And, and, uh, at Christmas. Now, the text, the sermons are based on Scripture, don't worry, not, not a novel, but that's inspiration for it. And we're going to do kind of a book study later on in December, so if you haven't read that book yet, I would encourage you to pick it up. It's real easy, real short. I mean, if you like to read, you'll have it done in one sitting, and uh, you'll just feel better reading it. But our, our kind of each week is going to be inspired by a different part of that. For example, next week, when we get started, uh, the theme it comes from a phrase in the book, that describes Narnia, which is, it's always winter and never Christmas, okay? So, if you know somebody who likes that, come on, bring them with us. Now, our text today as we wrap up is 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 22. Let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. 
God, we thank you for giving us your wisdom through these words of Scripture. We recognize how much we need them, for we know that just our own wisdom is limited. Self-referential guidance is just not going to cut it for making life count for us. And so we ask that you would speak your truth to us. Open our eyes and open our hearts to receive what you have to say and the obedience to live by it. And we pray in the same way that David prayed in the Psalms and asked that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts are found worthy in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let's do the word of God from 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 22. These are Paul's last instructions to Timothy. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. And when you come, bring the cloak that I have left with Carpus at Troas. Also the books and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Pisgah and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as does Prudence, Linus, and Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Prophet Isaiah declared that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. As Paul is wrapping up this message, it's pretty obvious that there's one thing that's critically important to this matter of pursuing the purpose for which God has created us, and it's about people. In the end, our whole life is played out in the matrix of people. That is why I think Jesus tells the, the leader who came to him and said, what's the great, greatest commandment? And he said, well, I'm Jesus, I can give you two. Love God and love your neighbor, love people. Because our whole life is played out in that. Everything about us is shaped by the people around us and we, how we interact with the people around us. We were created for purpose, but also for community. For all that sense of purpose to be played out in relationship with others. And here's the thing that I think we all know. The relationships can bring us the greatest joy we've ever experienced and the greatest pain we'll ever experience. But the joy makes the risk worthwhile. And as we were talking about building relationships and friendship, that's the key issue that we need to lock into, is that the, the joy the value of relationships makes the risk worthwhile. Because I think when we're hurt, we say, I'm not going to trust people anymore. And we lose out. But it's the relationships and the value that they have that makes the risk worthwhile. See, Paul, we discover, is far more relational than we thought. I mean, anybody here who's heard much about Paul, read much about Paul, and thought, man, he's such a touchy-feely guy. Not really, right? Paul seems like really austere. All he cares about is the mission, the task before him. But the fact is that every one of his letters ends with comments about people. 
saying hello to people, talking about how good people are to him. And this letter is no different. There is in this closing passage I just read to you, there are uh, 17 people specifically named in these verses. I think I've not done the full count, but I think it's probably the most that are covered in any one of his other letters. Because in addition to the 17 specific people, there's a group of good people that had good favor, good thoughts about, which were all the brothers in Rome, along with those who are mentioned here, which goes then beyond the 17. But then there's also those who are deserters that go beyond that. But 17 people are specifically named, 15 of them, I would put in the category of being friends or at least colleagues, you know, people with whom he had a good relationship. And two of them were put in the category of people who broke relationship with him, broke trust with him. And what you can get a sense of, I think, as we read through that is how, how better we are with others in our lives. What it means that God created us for community is that we are better with people in our lives. Think about the people on this list and what they meant for Paul. And we don't have a lot of detail on all of them, but we have some that points out how valuable they are. One is Luke. Luke has been a regular participant in Paul's life and a regular companion, and he's the only one with him currently. Have you ever gone through a really hard time and everybody was mad at you or whatever? You did something wrong. Everybody abandoned you, but somebody stayed with you. And you get a sense of what it's like to have somebody in your corner when everyone else is gone. That's Luke. Mark is mentioned here. Mark is one that was on Paul's first missionary journey. Paul did three missionary journeys that are recorded in the book of Acts. Mark is on the first one. And if you read the story of Acts, you'll probably remember that something happened. Mark flinched or something. It's, we don't really know the details, but Paul says, you're out. You're not going with me on the second journey. And that caused Barnabas to go, well, look, he's not that bad. What he, you know, I'll take him. So his, Barnabas took him on his own journey. But somewhere along the way, as we can tell in uh, later texts, they reconciled. And they became friends again because Paul is saying, bring Mark with me. Now, remember, Paul knows he's going to die. His opinion is he's going to die. This second imprisonment is going to be the end for him. And what he's asking at the end of his life is bring Mark back, bring him to us. Then you have Crescens, Titus, and Tychicus, which I think are probably people that are being sent off for commissions to lead churches, so you know they're valuable to what he has to offer and what the kingdom of God is doing. You've got Prisca and Aquila. Prisca is short for Priscilla. We've heard about Priscilla and Aquila earlier and the role they played. They were some of the first to start a house church. Priscilla was one of the first Leaders, a female was a leader of a house church along with her husband, Aquila. They were key to what Paul was doing and key supporters of his. There's Onesiphorus, who is mentioned at the very beginning of this letter as somebody who refreshed him. People who refresh us are nice to have around, aren't they? If you've been around people who do the opposite, that are like, <laughs> suck you dry, make you look like a you know, metaphorical raisin, you know what it's like to have somebody who refreshes you who does things that encourage you. You've got Erastus, who is a treasurer in Corinth that appears from Romans 16, and that's a leader in the church for Paul. I can't imagine how significant he was for them. You've got Trophimus listed, who was, uh, who it, when Paul ended his third uh, missionary journey, he took an offering to Jerusalem, and it was Trophimus that went with him. I get a sense in my head that Trophim, Trophimus was not to be trifled with. As Paul had an offering and Trophimus went with him, I think Trophimus is a guy that's kind of scary, kind of big. He's like, he's like his security presence. We don't know that for certain, but I mean, why would he accompany him for that one part? Then you got what appears to be members of the church there in Rome, Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, and Claudia, that are there in that community and have done something to cause them to be named specifically in fact, Linus is the successor to Peter as the bishop of Rome. And then finally, just want to throw out one guy here. I think he's male. He's Carpus. Now, what did Carpus do? You heard me read it. What, what is, what's Carpus's role in this story? He kept Paul's stuff for him. 
Like he says, go to Carpus to get my, my coat because it's cold. And he had like one coat. Paul, you know, just got by with what he needed. He had one coat. It wasn't like he could run to Walmart and get a coat or if there was some kind of Christmas coat ministry that would bring him a coat while he's in prison. He didn't have that. And but Carpus kept his coat. Carpus kept his books. Carpus kept his parchments. And because of that, Carpus is in Scripture forever. Now think about that. Carpus didn't accompany Paul to protect the offering to Jerusalem. Carpus didn't go start a church. Carpus wasn't hanging in there with Paul every hour and minute he was in jail. Carpus said, I'm good. I will take care of your stuff, Paul. That was the role he could play for him. And we may think, oh, it's not important. No, that is important. Have you been really cold before? Carpus changed that for Paul. You can be a Carpus, and you can be a Mark, a Luke. And you're still valuable. There is great joy in having people with us. We are better with others in our lives than we are alone. That's not how we're made. But here's the thing. There is risk in relationships. We recognize that. We've all suffered from that reality. And Paul has people who have let him down, two people specifically. You have Demas, who was uh, with him in his missionary journeys, was with him there when he was in prison. He was a man with whom he had a significant relationship. And something happened that caused Demas to go back to Thessalonica. And what I think we need to recognize is you hear grief in what Paul, when Paul describes that. You hear grief that Demas has left him because Demas was important to him. But you also don't hear the kind of condemnation that's reserved for Alexander. In fact, you don't hear anything. It's just an observation. And what's likely to happen, even John Calvin, who's not notably a touchy-feely guy either, was talking, you know, commenting on this text and says he probably thinks that Demas was simply worried about his security. And just kind of got tired of life on the road and wanted to go back where he was safe and secure. And that was hard for Paul because he meant something to him and he left him. Then you have Alexander who's clearly a problem child. Alexander the coppersmith did something that was so egregious to Paul that Paul said he damaged the church and told Timothy, hey, stay away from him. Like there's sometimes people that you have to be able to recognize are so de- dangerous, so detrimental, you have to create a boundary with them. He's saying to Paul, just, just stay away from this guy. I mean, whatever Alexander did, I mean, some, po- some think that he probably turned witness against Paul for the Roman authorities or, or you know, turned him in, kind of like the way Judas did to Jesus. But something happened. It was huge. Then there's a third group. That was the deserters. See, Paul had two two trial times. He had the initial trial, which is part of the Roman judicial process. He had the initial trial and said no one showed up for him. No one came to stand with him. No one came to bear witness to him being a good person and try to keep him from being in prison. He was on his own. He was abandoned. And can you imagine? I mean, he's already identified people that had been with him. There are people in that city, and nobody came. I mean, the pain of that has got to be, had to have been significant. And it, but they, he responds to them in different ways. He doesn't, he doesn't respond to everyone the same way. I think there's three kinds of responses here that we need to recognize that can shape what happens when people break trust with us, that hurt us, that I think can shape the way we build relationships with people today. The first level of response is that, like I just say, it was leniency. It's forbearance. I mean, he doesn't make any charge against Demas. He doesn't demand any actions. He doesn't make any promises of revenge. He's not happy. But you get a sense that Paul knew Demas well enough to know that Demas didn't desire harm to Paul. He's just in a moment of weakness left. And because of the lack of kind of fire and vigor and anger or anything, 
I think Paul's willing to say, I, I know Demas' heart, and I'm willing to let that pass. And I think sometimes we need to do that. That if, we can, if we're going to have relationships that are going to feed us, there's some level that when people hurt us, at some level we may recognize, you know what? I know what their heart is. I know they didn't mean that. And it gives us an opportunity to say, hey, let's, let's work this out. Let's talk through this. Let's see if we can make this right. It's kind of born in a humility that says, you know, Demas may have done this to me. Well, not Demas, but, you know, this person may have done this to your eye this week. But it's very likely, and I know I'm capable of it if didn't do it, that I might have done something bad to somebody last week. And there's a level of forbearance and leniency that makes relationships work because it's just too much to scrutinize every offense, every experience, and to say, are you worthy of me staying, staying in relationship with me? That's a pretty harsh world to live in, and we can't handle that. We'll soon be lonely, and that's a problem in this world. Research has shown it pretty clearly that as a society, our ability to have meaningful friendships have plummeted. The research showing the last 10 years even, people who are asked, do you have a significant friendship, a meaningful friendship in your life, the numbers have plummeted. You can say it was COVID, but it's happening before that. We've isolated ourselves, and it's bad for us. In fact, our health officials have said it's a pandemic of its own, the problem of community and the inability to have friendships. Friendships are too important. Relationships are too important. To not at some level be able to say, okay, that, that I can, I'm going to forbear that. I'm going to be lenient because I know that person's heart. Now, sometimes it's more significant than that. And Paul recognized that because there's a second category of response is for the deserters, right? I mean, these people that let them down and they hurt them. But what does he do? He shows them mercy. He doesn't necessarily say he's going to reestablish maintain relationship with them, but he shows them mercy. What does he do? He says, essentially, Lord, don't hold it against them. Don't hold it against them. That's his response to those who deserted him. And I think that's significant because it's the same mercy that was shown Paul. If you go back to Acts chapter 6, Stephen, one of the leaders of the church at that time, was mur martyred. He was stoned to death, picked up rocks and killed him. A brutal way to kill somebody, a brutal way to die. It doesn't happen all at once, right? He's just pummeled into death. And laying at the feet of Paul, who was Saul at that time, what does Stephen do as he's being pummeled to death? As he's dying, he says, Father, don't hold this sin against them. It's essentially what Paul said about the deserters. He said, don't hold this charge against them. And Stephen was simply doing what Jesus did for all the people who were, who were the cause of his own execution. And he says on the cross, for Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There's a leniency that he offers, a grace that he offers and says, Father, forgive them. But it doesn't mean that they're going to remain in his life forever. It doesn't mean people have to remain in our lives forever. But it does keep us from fixating on what they've done. And it opens up the possibility because it emotionally frees us from feeling the need for vengeance. That there may be reconciliation in the future. That God may bring that story to completion where there's restoration. So there's an opportunity where we may need to set boundaries, but there's an opportunity to show grace and the hope of reconciliation. See you guys. <laughs> but the third, the third level of offense here is also important. Sometimes we need to protect ourselves. Whatever Alexander did, it was so bad that 
Paul is saying to Timothy, just stay away from them. And he says, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. He, he sees the significance, and it's good to recognize there are times when people, what people do is so egregious and so painful that we need, need to insulate ourselves from them. And the fact that the prospect of joy of relationship has gone. But that's necessary sometimes. That's what Paul did with Alexander. You may have heard that saying, you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. You can't change who's around you. And Paul, and Paul shows us sometimes healthy boundaries are necessary to protect us from egregious harm in the future. And that's okay. I think we have a hard time with that as Christians. I think we're told, hey, you just got to forgive everybody and just bring it all, let it all come right back into your lap. And that's a horrible concept. If what someone has done to you is so abusive that not setting that boundary just endangers you to be abused again. But notice this, in all three cases, in all three cases, we can entrust God with the consequences of people's behavior. Paul never says to Alexander, which I think would be a prime candidate, I'm going to track you down if I get out of prison, and I'm going to go to every town you're in, and I'm going to post signs in front of your coppersmith shop, tell everybody what a horrible person it is. I'm going to poison you if I can. I'm going to, when they invent guns, I'm going to mow you down in the village streets for what you did. Now, come on, how many people would not have that mindset? I would do something, you know, hurt my people. My reaction is, I am coming for you because it's just that human instinct. Now, I know you may want to say you're better than me, but come on. Are you really? Do we not all have that instinct? Paul was no different than us. He had that instinct. But what does he do? Every case, he turns it over to God. Rather than taking action himself, he says, for the people who deserted him, God, don't let, hold that against them. And for Alexander, who just was so terrible that he had to break relationship with him permanently, he says, hold it against them. But never does he say, I am going to kill them. See, I think we don't handle it well when we take control of the responses. We're not capable of handling that well. God handles it much better than, than us. Now, and you may have already recognized this. But I've been around some people who just illustrate it so well. I mean, I, when I was a kid, we spent lots of time with my aunt who lives in Thomaston, Alabama. And all of my mom's relatives, whatever, would come there. And it was great fun. I mean, it's the best time. We walk down to the country store and buy candy, and stick your hand in those big jars, get pieces of candy out. And one of the most entertaining parts of the whole experience is that my aunt did not have a dishwasher. And so everybody had to wash, I mean, to wash dishes. So we have a great meal, and everybody kind of move off, put their hands in their uh, you know, the pants, and kind of whatever that reason we do that after we've eaten a lot, just sit back, watch TV, and enjoy the evening. But I would sit down and listen to the people washing dishes, because it was amazing. It was like an like a art form that was happening in front of me, is that they would start talking, and they'd start talking about everybody they knew. And it was, you don't mean, do tell. Did she really do it? Well, bless her heart. I mean, it was, it was like in Christmas story, the father like wove a tapestry of profanities you know, that, you know, still hung over Michigan or whatever it was. I mean, they, they could deal in gossip and, and, you know, talking bad about people and like this artistry of saying the worst things and having the nicest tone of voice and doing it. And I would just mesmerize, like, I don't know who that lady is, but, man, she's in trouble. It was impressive when you're like eight. But what you realize as you get older and start thinking about these things is we're not at our best when we decide I'm the one who's going to be the purveyor of justice. I'm the one who's going to take action to avenge 
people that offend me. We're just not at our best with you. We're too corrupted, too broken. Sin has too great of a hold on us to be able to do that. We need to give it to God because that kind of poison just sticks with us. And it affects us as much as the actions that someone else does to us. We have to give it to God. But that's all right. God can handle it. You know, it was Jesus was one who everybody let him down. Remember? He was arrested and everybody abandoned him. Peter denied him. No one was there. His mama was there because mamas are always going to be there. But he, he died on the cross as one who abandoned him. But God didn't abandon him. Right? Luke, Luke is talking about Jesus' experience, and it says, there appeared to Jesus an angel from heaven strengthening him. Paul says that. when he's, no, no one was with him. He was left alone. He was deserted, but he says, God stood by me when I was in, on trial. God was with him. Everybody may let you down, but God is going to be with you. It's worth the risk to build friendships because when they let you down, don't worry, God will not let you down. It's worth it. And there's a risk, but God is bigger than the risk. You know, Paul took a risk with all these people. He suffered in the, in the, the, the harm that their abandonment caused. But what, what does he say about it? He says it gave him the opportunity still to, if Alexander turned him in, it gave him an opportunity to bear witness to Jesus Christ in the Roman court, which would have been the, all of the serious leaders of Roman society. It may even have been the emperor himself. That would not have been uncommon for the emperor to be there at a big trial like that. He may have been able to speak to Nero himself about the gospel of Jesus Christ. What other way than being arrested, being turned in, arrested, and put on trial, does Paul have than speak the gospel to the most significant leaders in Roman society? I mean, I won't think I want to sign up for that. But we can see that when we take risk, God's good. And God can bring out of brokenness and hurt something we never imagined possible. We were created for relationships. Do you have relationships in your life that form your community of friendship? It's hard to take that risk. But I would encourage you, take the risk. Because relationships can bring us the greatest joy we've ever experienced, but it's certainly in community and relationships that God is going to navigate us living out our purpose in life because we exist to love God and to love people. Without people, we can't do that. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would help us navigate uh, building community. Particularly, Lord, we ask that where there has been hurt where there's been pain, we pray that you would heal that in such a way that we might be able to move forward, trusting you, even though it's a risk, trusting that, God, you are greater than the risk, and the joy of friendships mean that much to who we are, how you created us to live, because we can't love people if there aren't people in our lives to love. I pray, Father, that we might be able to have a path laid out for us by your good hand, by the Holy Spirit, to guide us to the people in our lives with whom we can open our hearts to trust, to take a risk, and to build friendships. We're better off with people around us, Lord. Just help us to have that community because we know you love us. But it's very tangible when we see people in our lives who love us to know that if These people can love us. Certainly God can love us too. Help us find that contentment in relationships. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.